there's nothing new about mechanical rides. They arrived more or less with the railways. As an exhilarating escape from the cares of everyday life, they became a feature of fairgrounds all over the world, from Blackpool to Coney Island. And in the 60s, when Walt Disney took the need to escape and built an entire fantasy world to cater for it, the ride took off. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain. Two years ago in England, it came back to Earth with a bang. The ride of life, as the name suggests, is a theme ride. Its purpose is not, as it was with Disney, to escape reality, but to confront it. Described as one of the greatest collaborative works of art since the King James Bible, the Ride of Life was commissioned from dozens of artists the length and breadth of the country. The proposal was to construct a journey through everyday life to fill 15,000 square feet of prime site in Sheffield. Because of its size, studios had to be improvised in disused cotton mills, garages, barns, even an old church. Heaven was to be made in Cornwall and hell in Hebden Bridge. And the improbable patrons for this wild venture, Europe's brightest new shrine to leisure shopping, Meadow Hall. We're on the radio, WRAD, live from Meadow Hall, the center of England, home of the Rock on the Diner, in Europe's biggest shopping mall. When we get shaky, moaning, moaning. I Artists and retailers make unlikely bedfellows. But to Meadowhall's credit, they gave the artists virtually a free hand. The brief was simple. Fill 15,000 square feet of this unique fast food area. Marketing designers are beginning to realize that they need the original thought of artists to excite and attract customers, a view championed by Ron McCarthy. I've always been in the world marketplace, if you will, in my travels, been looking for unique products that we can bring into the, the leisure mix. And having had several trips to London and uh, just discovering the Cabaret Mechanical Theater in the basement of, of Covent Garden, began to see a tremendous opportunity in, in, if we'd expanded the product. It's an exhibition of automata, and if you look it up in the dictionary, it's supposed to be machine imitating man. Remember those things on the pier years and years ago where you put your penny in and Mary Queen of Scots had her head chopped off? It's a very sophisticated version of that. ticket to a life-size mechanical man. When the mechanical man pulls the ticket, he stamps his stamp into the ink pad, stamps it across on the ticket, and you get a picture of the man himself plus the date. There's 69 machines, I think it is now, we keep adding to it which you operate yourself by pressing the button. The idea is as long as you keep your finger on, each box does a little performance for you. This man called Ron McCarthy, who it turns out to be this leisure magnet man, 
And he comes in and he swings his arms around and he says, this is absolutely wonderful. And he said, we've got to do, we've got to do, we've got to have this. This is, this, I've scoured the world, he said. And on their part, they were very reluctant to even begin these discussions, but I, I persisted and uh, told them that there was a tremendous opportunity here to be involved in some of the projects that, that I was involved in. Anyway, he was pretty determined, and we ended up calling them the Meadow Men, or I did, because the new shopping centre was called Meadow Hall. And he came in, and then there were two, and then there were three. And literally, in the end, ten of them came in, in their suits, determined to do business. So the concept is you see people in a conveyance system. They've been shopping for three or four hours, and all of a sudden they can sit themselves down and relax and say, wow, I just want to be entertained. I want, to, I want humor. Uh, I want some excitement. And uh, with all while you're sitting down and, and going through this. So that already had uh, a, a tremendous opportunity, I felt. Now it was a question of how could we develop the scenes and the animation and the lighting that would be an extension of what they were already doing so well uh, in a bigger format. And he said, now look, I'm going to give you 10,000 pounds, no strings attached. Think up an idea, he says, to fill this shopping center. So there's a sort of attraction about shopping centers for me anyway, that uh, they're popular, you know, people, loads of people go to them, uh, unlike art galleries. Um, and although they're sort of revoltingly materialistic in a sort of way, um, if you just sort of work, I've been working in sort of more fine art things, uh, I, I got sort of rather fed up sort of just working in a, in a garret sort of thing. It just feels sort of rather cut off. Um, and it sort of, it was so much the spirit of the age of the sort of mad, fatuous sort of consumerism that it sort of, be, it was sort of very intriguing to sort of be part of it. And I can't remember who thought of it. We, we spent till way after lunchtime and nobody could think of anything. And uh, in the end, Gary said, let's go and have a drink. So we all went to the pub and we had a drink and we came back. And from thence on, the ideas came out and we couldn't keep up with them. I think it was Tim Hunkin and Paul Spooner who suddenly said, let's do a ride. If we do a ride, you can sort of be carried from one scene to another. And we can do a sort of whole ride of life, if you like. So we suddenly thought, this was it. And then we thought, everybody in the whole world has a sofa. We thought, that's it. You start off in your living room on the sofa, and you go through 20 different scenes of life. I think on the basis of that, uh, we got into this meeting with Ron and said, well, we ought to go to Disney World and uh, have a look round. <laughs> Disney World is, is just weird. It's even more bizarre than Meadow Hall in a way. Um, it, it's on such a scale. We could only survive two days of it. It all got too much, but it was very fascinating. There were three of us, so it was Gary and uh, Tim Hunkin and me, and we were the ones who were sent off. What we saw was what we expected to see, which was a very clean, wonderfully well-made thing. You can see people going and paying their money, and they just stand there. And th this was their culture, even though they came from Peru or Guatemala or Cambodia or wherever the hell they come from. The best thing was a Cadillac, really. We rented a Cadillac and drove around in that a lot. That was one of the treats, yeah, is you could put your foot down on the gas and it had uh, uh, this little dial which told you how many miles you were doing to the gallon and it went down to one. <laughs> I don't approve of that, I mean, the whole, but I mean the whole thing is so bizarre, it's so mad that uh, I, I, I find it fascinating. <laughs> It certainly inspired uh, Paul's aeroplane. He was busy beavering away with his uh, <laughs> sketchbook all the time we were in the plane. I think also, it, yes, it focused our attention on what we didn't want it to be like. You know, we wanted it to be chaotic. We wanted it to have, uh, to, to be disjointed, um, to not for have one set not to look like the next, uh, to be, <laughs> uh, not to be bland. 
The trip to America did help the artists' ideas and their perceptions. It sharpened their focus. Two years after the visit, Walt Disney would not recognize his influence. Instead of a dubious history lesson or jingoistic fantasy, the ride became a satire on the British way of life. This is the, the sign to go outside the ride of life. It's really showing the basic idea of the ride, which is that people travel through a, a series of uh, bizarre scenes of life, sitting on settees. It's a vast variety of different people who worked on the project. I guess there are 20 odd people. Some have been spending a lot of time actually making a very small automaton, and in a way their sets are, are much more like you know, larger scale versions of that, slot machines. And then other people have approached it from maybe a more theatrical background, so they're much more environmental sets. So, I mean, that's one of the most exciting things, is that it's all these different styles. Because there were so many different people involved, and they all were very, very good in what they did, we had an opportunity of really creating a, a product that had a different group, different personalities all the way through it. And that made it unique in its own. I mean, it wasn't predictable. In other words, it wasn't going through a Disney ride, that it was Disney all the way through. All those animations were predictable, although the sets and the scenes were different. All of a sudden, here we were going through sets done by different artists. And in, and in that way, it created its own, its own bit of magic. Well, here we are in the uh, chicken factory. And the first scene that you see is a night watchman asleep in a chair. Up above him, a, a pair of robots stirring the chicken extract in a large vat. And then you follow the path of the extract down a tube. You move on quickly to the chicken press, where the extract has been squashed out into sort of chicken nugget shapes. As the press lifts up, you see the operator's head's also been squashed in the same machine as well. Then we move on to the uh, soldering section which are three very bored, pissed off ladies soldering chickens' legs back on, viewed by a boss and a typist in a tower above. Several seconds into the scene, the ladies decide to make their escape, and uh, to the music of Thunderbirds, they ride out of the scene, illuminated by a mirror ball, like Stephen Green in The Great Escape, on a moped to freedom. I was convinced that they really had their act together. Um, their lifestyles were quite different from ours, but you know they they had uh, a, they had their craft down to to a science, and they knew exactly where they were going. And I like that. It's probably more surprising seeing the box of tricks from such a normal exterior. I think it probably won't be quite as peculiar when you've stood in the queue and you waited to go around it. But uh, everybody's laughed. Everyone's laughed. All different sorts of people have. I think it's all been favourable reactions, but sometimes you do get close to the characters that you make. Like, I felt quite sad about the late poor ladies working in the conveyor belt room, and you think, oh, you know, you've destined them to a life of <laughs> working on that conveyor belt. The ride was built very much on purpose for, to go into the shopping centre, you know, to go into the mirage of Meadow Hall, and everybody's humour has worked against that uh, being its space. The other thing I relished about the situation is I like being in situations where I'm sort of poking fun at dubious institutions. Um, it's always been an interest of mine. So I really wanted to use it to do something about consumerism. I suddenly had the idea of this research laboratory and it all sort of fell into place. I mean, there's a whole sort of quite complicated psychology and that was what I was really wanting to make fun. And the research laboratory seemed an ideal vehicle to do it. <laughs> It's a sort of Californian idea that you, you go shopping not because you have a sort of material need to buy something, but because you just psychologically you need to do a bit of shopping. And I mean, I hate shopping centres. I'd never go near one, but I mean, in a bookshop or, or uh, a tool shop or a scrapyard or something, I, I can sort of feel the same tendencies of sort of wanting to come away with something. Uh, I suppose, you know, I mean, we're all part of the sort of society we live in, really.
don't like shopping centres at all. Um, but we we work on the basis that we like making things. Making things is a learning process. We get paid for them is a good thing anyway. So um, what is we don't we find that getting rid of things like after we've made it and it's out of our system, then we just want to get rid of it. We work on a sort of Tesco ethic of pile them high, sell them cheap. We move a lot of things. We always make things. Well, we were approached by a cabaret mechanical theatre in London and asked us for an idea. So the idea was for tomorrow, so it's one of these back of the bag packet ideas with the cafe. And nine months later, we're right. carrying it through. So. But it was either that or a barbers, and they like cafe. Um, we're very, very low tech. This is a uh, Ladybird Book of Science stuff. Um, bits of bent wire and holes drilled. And it's been a real struggle for me because I wasn't sort of trained in anything sort of engineering wise. <laughs> using scrap and second-hand materials. It started out as necessity of not having any money and also liking the character of things that are old and been used before. And now it's just very difficult to go and buy something new. It just seems terrible. We just gather things. That's why we live in Hull. There's so much stuff around. sort of monument to consumer society. This is where your fridge goes. This is, I mean, this is just wonderful. But it's really sad in a way because it takes so much energy to like, boil up with some steel to turn it into a fridge. And then after two years, people chuck it away and get a pink one or a blue one. So it wasn't happening in Japan. And then they just get mushed up. And then the cycle begins again. Get sent off to the steel work, make a flatten it, boil it up, flatten it out, and it becomes a fridge again, or a car, or anything else. Transformers, metals, more solenoids. Yeah, they're worth having, aren't they? They're worth a fortune, limit switch. It's like the Arthur Negus Roadshow identified this object. <laughs> well, only looks for motors and switches. That's a tin can. Nice old That's knobs. Nice. Wonderful things from the 1950s. Things that have disappeared everywhere else, but eventually here in whole scrapyards end up on the heap. Things that you'd forgotten about from your dim and distant childhood. Right? Wonderful radiators and radios. Crap. And that's the sort of great monument to consumerism. It's bye, bye, bye. Step in there and buy a new fridge. And then out the back, there's people pushing the stuff in the skip. People will obviously have favourites. There's an Adam and Eve pub in there, which is rather good too. And there's Adam and Eve behind the bar and a Viking. And there's sort of pulsating apples on the top. And there's a wonderful museum scene. This is done by a person called Guy Richardson, who was, he only made puppets before. And uh, it's a whole Egyptian museum. You go through with mummies and these sorts of things. As you see. But also in this, there is a theme park. And this is one of the things that the Meadow Hall people didn't, didn't really um, understand at all. Um, because Paul decided that he'd take off every theme park in the whole world and need a little model. And they, didn't, they took it seriously. They didn't understand the theme park. We're flopping. We're not very good at winning, are we? <laughs> but he's going to have 46 little Britons, as he calls them, little gnomes. And they're all going to blink at exactly the same time with these huge eyes. As they go about their daily duties, 
um, they will all do it ex exactly the same time because that's what's so terrible about theme parks. They're really awful. And they all do this. In theme parks all over the country, Britain's heritage is being packaged and sold back to the people who already own it. At Land's End in Cornwall, with its souvenir shops and designer bars, visitors pay to see an audio-visual experience of the sea within yards of the real thing. The sea. It's a problem with heritage, you can't really improve it. The only way to deal with it is to leave it alone. And the object of these things is to take what exists already and package it in a form that people will pay for. But it's, it's a doomed enterprise, because what people really come to see, I imagine, is, is the stuff that's here already. And every single thing you put on it buggers it up a little bit. It's a bizarre irony that people come to the end of the place, stand in a room and watch a telly programme about what they can see outside. You know that when you get to the end of the road, there's the sea at the end of it, and it sloshes around in a satisfying way for some people. And, uh, and that's really the end of the story. Because I imagine the North Pole would be the same. If <laughs> you could do a tourist thing at North Pole. If enough people went there, they'd set up something and they'd take a few bob off you. But really, the, the decent thing to do here would be to give everybody a cup of tea and they could get in their cars and go somewhere else. Well, we have to put them wherever they'll stand up straight. In a field near their studio in Cornwall, Paul Spooner and Brian Buckley are assembling their own theme park for the first time. They don't even know how big it's going to be. So that they relate to each other. Main Street UK and its 46 Little Britons is the one piece of the ride of life that Walt Disney would recognize and may even have enjoyed. Main Street UK is named after the wonderful Main Street USA in two, maybe three, maybe four Disney worlds now. And the idea of Main Street USA was that it encapsulated all that was wonderful about America. And um, this is our version for, for Great Britain. It's meant to be a very high-tech, high-quality. It's just tremendous attention to detail and historical accuracy is what we're after. Valves are fine, it was Spooner's fault. <laughs> yeah, just a loose one. If we try another one now, that will... Yeah. If that cuts it down, if you put a lot in, we might get away with a big run, but I think we're going to have to put restrictions in all of the thingies. We've had uh, teams of historians working on exactly what Mary Queen of Scots looked like and the exact circumstances under which uh, these things happened. Fothering Gay Castle is precisely the way um, it would have been in those days, whenever they were. Is that on or off? That's on. <laughs> Gonna have to put it on a much shorter loop. Yeah. There's 30 meters in those. I've just really? sent it off to get another 120 meters. You see, we've distilled the essence of the British character. We've more or less got it down to a kind of average. Of course, everybody's a bit different for the sake of cost. We couldn't make everybody exactly uh, the way they would be in real life, and they are idealized to a certain extent. In fact, our statue is the ideal form, the statue we've called uh, our boy. Being ironical about it, it's, I, I'm really having to be a bit more straightforward about it because it's fairly fashionable. You can hardly turn the radio or the telly on before, without hearing somebody taking the piss out of theme parks and saying that, uh, that we are becoming a, we are becoming an attraction in ourselves and we're all going to have to start dressing up as, as, uh, as the British soon uh, in order for tourists to come around and look at us. It's everybody who tries to make a few bob out of pretending that things are education, really. Well, you know it, I well, isn't it? That's what I find irritating and wrong about all this sort of stuff. This kind of crap. I 
I've never seen this bloody lot all in one heat before, and it's, uh, I'm afraid I've, I was wrong. Um, I misjudged how big it was and, uh, and how long it takes to connect all the pipes to all these things. Plus, you know, all the sort of little troubles that you might have anyway. Even just installing it, I know now that we'll take a week installing this thing. Piece by piece, scene by scene, the ride was delivered from all over the country to a vast warehouse in Rotherham. Within a mile of the warehouse, John White created three of the major scenes, disorientation, the upside down bedroom, and motorway madness. He works in an abandoned garage in the shadow of the old steel mills. I always used to make machines when I was a kid. I made like a four-wheel bicycle. I used to zip around a lot of stuff, promenade on and stuff like that. I mean, I really like getting things from scrapyards, and you get different things in different parts of the country, like Birmingham's good for pneumatics, and, and I've got a really nice wooden propeller in Middlesbrough. Sheffield stuff tends to be quite heavy, really. This is the last bit of the ride of life that's actually left in the workshop. This is the crane from Motorway Madness. So the sofa comes in to this set, and it's got the, the Bedford TK lorry in front of the sofa, and the sofa stops, and uh, a voice says, your vehicle has jumped the lights, it will now be removed, at which point this crane starts swinging in over the top of the sofa. Oh, I've got to watch out for the lights in this room. It's a bit, bit, whoa, a bit big for the room, this. It's all going to be controlled by the logic controller, but I couldn't do that in here because uh, there weren't really enough room. This is a Mexican for a restaurant in Bristol. John is mad about engineering. Unlike some of the others, he found the huge scale and complex technology no great challenge. This is good. If Meadowhall can be called a cathedral to one age, then all around it is the graveyard of another, and John White is one of its keepers, as his work so lovingly shows. This is a mechanism from the Lagerlap Cherub, which is there, with his, uh, he hasn't got his trumpet in. Uptown top ranking, dancers. The shoulders have got like a washing machine gearbox. There's this big floor that spins round and rocks backs and forwards, and she sort of shaking her head, and that guy there, and he's like all made out of spring, so he wobbles about like mad. As you control the joystick, the whole thing soars around, and he's like, oh, and she's going, all right. I spent a bit of time in Newcastle this year, and I started, I mean, like they say, let's say, oh, no, they say, oh, no. So I was thinking about this Noah's Ark thing. Um, I just plugged this dog in, so it's uh, making a noise. Here he is. Here's his plug. The idea was basically just this quite simple thing, just like a Noah's Ark, which is going to be like a mirror behind each of the animals. So you get two of them, because like you've got to have two by two in Noah's Ark. There's a monkey. If I can get to it, it's a bit heavy. This is an old petrol pump, but uh, it's just archetypal monkey. Couldn't believe it when I saw that in a scrapyard. Whoops, it springs come out. But then it's not finished, so what do you expect? Oh, I mean, I hate the cold. I really hate the cold. I thought there must be something I can do with this. And uh, I made up these uh, rubber moulds and started, uh, I just left them outside overnight, filled with water. I've got a bit more sophisticated now. I've got this rather modern freezer here. The, um, the bell, British made, BEL. So, um, cast up these ice gear wheels, which um, actually run in machines and drive each other around. Um, for a bit, I wanna, I'd like to expand the idea, but it's a matter of getting, I mean, this is as big as I can make in a domestic freezer. 
And I've tried to persuade butchers to let me use their fridges and stuff, but nobody seems particularly interested. And that's it, really. I mean, the knife with a bit of light behind them. So it's just like the translucency of the ice. Normally use a kettle with boiling water for this, so this is a bit, uh, should be quite fast. Now, this might be quite a tight fit, I've just realised. Sometimes, uh, that's done. Nice and gently. Way. That's one. And the other one. Oh, he's flying off. Just shed a few teeth at first. Well, it's just a movement, really. I just like things that move. I mean, it's it, it's a whole different aesthetic, really, the sort of graceful actions of things or the manic actions of things or whatever. And it's just the movement in general, really. Like some of the old Victorian machines, which although they had, like, direct columns and stuff in, looked... Um, I mean, the way they move, some of the movements are fantastic. I mean, I, I think that they wouldn't have actually gone as far as putting columns and stuff in and, and like, Greek imagery if they weren't trying to make something that was aesthetically pleasing as well as functional. All my sculptures have humour in. And I've tried to make things that aren't humorous and I've never succeeded. I've never actually managed to make something that's completely serious and people don't laugh at. Everybody laughs at it. to design and build hell. The first design was quite different to the second design. The first one was a traffic jam going down towards a sort of horrible revolving discotheque. Uh, we were asked to do something more humorous. You know? So we came up with the idea of miniature scene. So it's more like a, a miniature landscape. You know? painting of the Tower of Babel that's in the uh, museum in Rotterdam was, was a big source of inspiration. Uh, so we made that the centrepiece. We've done a sort of industrial version of the Tower of Babel, clad in scaffolding, which revolves and has cranes on it. And that's the thing that the, the, the people travelling on their little sofas disappear into. So it's the final mystery of hell, of what happens inside the Tower of Babel. We've been working on it, make, building it for about 18 months now. And um, it's only just now, really, that we've put the whole thing together like a great big jigsaw puzzle with the lighting and the sound. So I do still find it quite fascinating to have a look through these little windows and see what the audience would see. There was a definite relationship between the site at Meadow Hall, which was uh, covered in steelworks. So all the steelworks went, and now we have uh, a massive theme park shopping centre there. And I think hell echoes the old steelworks to some extent. The original Meadow Hall works made steel. Yorkshire's new leisure shopping centre is committed to making brass. Tickets to ride on the Ride of Life would not be cheap, but it would never earn a fortune. 
where Andy, Lucy, and John White see scrap merchandise as art, Ron McCarthy sees art as merchandise. And who's to say he's wrong? The ride of life has two very important components to it. First of all, that being the ride. Uh, so it's a paid admission. You take the tour. Uh, but as people now know in, in the theme park business, uh, especially in North America, that one of the biggest opportunities in revenue, both for the artists and for the operators, is that on the merchandising. And so we decided to, to describe or develop a, a graphic logo uh, that would represent the right of life. And I thought this was ingenious, too, because, again, taking the very simple concept of a sofa, uh, which was the ride itself, the conveyance system, and all of a sudden playing up on the sofa. Now, for example, you see here um, the logo that was done for the ride of life, a couple being caught um, kissing on a, on a sofa chair, which is wonderful which really says a lot about, again, the rest of the products and how they started to evolve. So, for example, picking up on what Peter Markey did before, again, the airplane ride here. Again, very, very simple mechanisms, all made out of wood. It's not a wind-up toy, does not need a battery, um, and it's the kind of thing everyone uh, would love. And again, you think about the sofa arms, you just unfold this, you lift this up, and you have yourself a telephone. So for as many sets as you have, you can have several types of, of merchandising for each set. Then we started thinking, well, we can now take those big pieces that we've developed, especially for the ride of life, scale them all down into smaller packages. So we're right back where we started. So we went to the theme park side of it and blew everything up, but then we brought it all back down again to have, again, the, the, the wide variety of, of uh, merchandising opportunities here. You go through all these 20 different scenes and you end up getting off at death, obviously. You get out of your, off your couch at death and then you have a choice of walking through heaven or walking through hell. Now, if you want to go into hell, you've got to pay 10 pence extra. If you haven't got 10 pence, there's no one there to give you any change. You've got to go through heaven. And Paul Spooner believes if you end up in heaven, you must have had the most goddamn boring life and you must be incredibly boring. So his version of heaven is 36 heads singing my way and they've all got I told you so in Greek on their pockets. My Everybody was going along quite nicely, thank you. And um, they just said, cut. We don't want it anymore. And that was the most terrible moment. I have as clear a memory of the occasion as the, as the Kennedy assassination, really. I was opening a garage door at the time. Um, I felt numbed, I think. I felt a certain amount of relief, too, to be, to be frank, um, because I thought, because I was working impossibly hard on it at the time. Um, and I did think, oh, well, that's a breather. We'll find out what this is all about. And then all the phones, we had a, we had a storm and we had a power cut and all the phones went off. So it did feel rather unreal. It really was. But we got a phone call through from Gary saying the project's cancelled, which was not really, it wasn't exactly cancelled. That's the thing. It was, it was not going into Meadow Hall, is there? was the... Uh, and that was the, the real fact of it. Um, and I just felt numb and, um, and read a book by candlelight until, you know, because it, it just seemed like a, it seemed like a numbing blow. It felt like a soft blow rather than a hard one at the time. And we had this terrible job of phoning up all these people who were all in the middle of making these things and saying they don't want it anymore. It's just been cut. We were never given a reason. thing now is what on earth is going to happen to it. 
I mean, I don't know if you've ever made anything, painted a picture, done a bit of music, or anyone who's ever created anything. While you're actually doing it, you have a series of pictures going along in your head. You imagine the people getting on the couch, going through your scene, and you imagine all this stuff. So immediately somebody says they don't want it, that's taken away, and the incentive is completely gone. in so much as they continue to pay for the sets to be finished. So what we have now is uh, 20 different scenes in cardboard boxes will be in a shed in Rotherham. And nobody knows what's going to happen. It was very sad when the decision was made to uh, find another location for the ride. Essentially what was happening, uh, this was a commercial development. There was a, a very large demand coming around on, on food. Uh, we weren't being able to provide enough seats for food. And, uh, and as a result, when we had 12,000 square feet uh, devoted to this new concept that, no one, that had never been test marketed yet, it was still something very, very new. Um, we had to make a, a very important commercial decision. shock in the beginning but the artist came back um, continued on and we paid them they finished the product and uh, and I, I commend them for that for sticking by it because that's a hard thing to do when someone says it no longer has a home but please can you finish it up Unless another patron is found, and found soon, the ride of life could end up in the scrapyard, or at best be sold off as individual pieces of sculpture. Returning to finish it under such circumstances was difficult for the artists. If the artists have lost a showcase for their work, the British public who inspired it will have lost a provocative image of themselves and their times. Where? Where's the Gorbachev? Oh, look, this eye's gone got scraped as well. There is one well-known photograph of George Formby in which he looks exactly like a buck to Prince Charles, but I fixed it in the end by putting smaller ears on, They're probably half-size ones. That's two separate ones. Oh, that's the solenoid. That's the solenoid, right. Yeah. Switch and we haven't around. got um, the pump. Oh, yeah, we have now. That's a dog. The first time we tried this out, I'd, I'd not actually been in the seat. I, I just put a, a sofa roughly where the sofa was going to stop. And this thing starts revving up, looking about like that. It makes the beeping noise, and there's loads of lights flashing inside and stuff. And then uh, it starts lurching forwards with this big ram here that's um, got a metre and a half stroke, uh, which is mounted onto this mechanism, which then um, which basically steers and controls the truck up. Oh, here's the dog again. Well done, and uh, so it's quite sturdy, but uh, nonetheless, it's really frightening. And then when the lorry's like two inches from you, you've got this mechanical grab above your head that's sort of going... Tsh, 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 tsh. So I think it's probably just as well they've got restraint bars on the sofa, really, so I think people just wouldn't stay there otherwise. <laughs> I 
I haven't visualized what's going to happen yet. No, I mean, we, we have these little, little units. Well, this is meant to be big. This is meant to be huge. This is, this is as big as I thought I would get in my lifetime. It looks like a pee and a whistle in this place, and it will be, uh, I, I expect when we, we're going to have mirrors, you know, so it's going to, it's going to appear bigger like the dog's thing. But uh, I'm, I'm only just getting some idea of the scale myself, really. And now I've seen Meadow Hall. I think it would have been fun. I think it, I think that, yes. I mean, a lot of things come down to timing, doesn't it? I think there'll be a, a time and a place for a right of life concept in, in the right market, in the right center. And, uh, and I think it'll, it'll prove to be a nice complement to the shopping center environment of, of this scale and, and larger. For example, there's a, a major project in the States which is under construction right now, which is called Mall of Americas, where, for example, Knott's Berry Farm are doing a, I believe it's about a five-acre indoor theme park with shopping all around it. It remains to be seen how, how well that will do, but certainly people are toying with the whole idea. I think still today a lot of people are, are incorporating games, arcades, and, and amusement facilities of that sort uh, within shopping centers, but now people are beginning to expand that opportunity. And I think you'll see in the future people like Disney uh, and other people who are developing very unique products and very unique characters coming into a shopping center environment. Perhaps one day we will have Mickey Mouse in a Disneyland shopping parade. Sadly, we won't have the ride of life in Meadow Hall. The dream took off in the booming 80s and crashed with the recession of the 90s. At the moment, the 15,000 square feet of valuable shopping space may be filled wall to wall with arcade games. While not too far away in a shed in Rotherham, the ride is over. Oh, I feel miserable in a way and yet at the same time very excited about it because of the scale of the thing i mean the things in here look so small and uh, in people's workrooms they look so huge but at the same time i feel very sad you know all these little packages just piled up everywhere with these wonderful things in them that you wonder if they'll ever be unpacked again about the cancellation of the whole thing is that I think it was a wonderful group of people to get together and I think if the thing ever had gone up uh, it would have led to other fruitful collaborations. The, the sets that I've seen set up are just fantastic. Um, I just hope it goes somewhere because it'll be such a good thing. I think people will love it. It's just a bit of a downer really just to carry on but there wasn't going to be any sort of end to it. It was just going to go into storage. It'd go rusty somewhere. So it's it a strange feeling. The ride of life, I think, ought to, in a sense, go to another country, to Japan or somewhere like that, rather than stay in Britain. Because Britain quite simply doesn't deserve it. I mean, it's such a big thing, all the different scenes. It's such a lot of good work. And uh, also, it's such an investment for, for Meadow Hall. We did our best work. And we've come up with something extraordinary. It's, uh, it's the most extraordinary ride in Britain, if not in the world. Ironically, heaven was on its way from Red Roof, which is a very suitable location, to Rotherham, which is an even more suitable location for, uh, for heaven, my kind of heaven, perishing. Um, uh, it was on its way in a huge lorry, which had up yours written in black letters on yellow. It was one of these curtain-sided things, and it actually said, uh, ship you up what did it say anyway the big letters were up yours and nobody here noticed because they were all under the under the the spell of the cancellation nobody even noticed that it said up yours i think they were six foot high <laughs>